Hey everyone, this is Jason Rodriguez with Z Prime. Thanks for being with us for the first few sessions of ETS 21. Very excited for the future mobility session of an amazing panel from micro mobility to scooters, bicycles, electric rail, uh, automated vehicles, school buses, semi trucks. Mobility is all has all the buzz, especially over the past year. Uh, so we're excited to bring this panel to you here at ETS 21 to talk more about some of the key issues driving the future mobility, but also how we get to that next stage and what the future looks like and what are the challenges that need to be overcome in electrification, um, uh, e-bikes, and also uh, automated vehicles. So with that, I'll get, we'll get right into it and have our panel join us. Welcome everyone today. How are y'all doing? Oh, good. All right, so just to kick it off, we will start with a few intros. So Drew Higgins, why don't you kick us off? Hey, thanks, Jason. Um, I am uh, the Senior Director for Product and, and, and Services at CPS Energy in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, CPS Energy is the largest publicly owned utility in, in the United States. We serve over a million customers with both electricity and gas. Um, San Antonio is one of the largest growing cities uh, in the United States, and, and we're really focused and, and, and primed, no pun intended, for the future. And uh, thank you very much for having me on this panel. Well, welcome. And Amy. Hey, good morning, everyone. My name is Amy Ashley. I am the um, senior lead for the EV equity program um, at Austin Energy, and we are the third largest public uh, power, city-owned public power in the U.S., um, and my team is working to bring um, all kinds of mobility options, um, transportation, electrification is a priority, and we're really working to ensure that we're bringing the entire community along with our programs um, to access affordability, um, uh, equity, and diversity with our programs. Thanks, Amy. Heather. <clears throat> Thanks, Jason, and nice to see everyone. Uh, my name is Heather House, and I'm a manager on RMI's Urban Transformation Program. Um, if you're not familiar with RMI, we're a nonprofit working on the energy transition. Um, we've been around since the 80s and really focus on um, heavily on decarbonization of industries. Uh, as it relates to transportation, our analysis indicates that we need to be reducing emissions by 45% in the US by 2030, which means getting 70 million EVs on the road by 2030 and reducing BMT by 20%. Um, I'm, I'm based in Colorado, but we work nationally and globally. So really excited to be here. And Carter. Hey everybody, thanks for having us today. My name is Carter Stern. I am on the cruise uh, government affairs team, for those of you who don't know, Cruise is a, an all-electric autonomous vehicle company. So I work on our energy policy, AB policy, all of the United States, and I'm excited to, to chat with this group today. Thanks for having us. Well, welcome, everyone. We're excited to get started. Uh, so this first question, I would like all of you to chime in on, on this first question because it's really, it'd be really interesting to hear the different perspectives. But uh, so first off, and, and Amy, let's start with you. Uh, what new variables have entered into the uh, the mobility conversation as a result of the pandemic? Well, I think it's really paralleled kind of how we've all had to react, our sort of steady and, and fast um, pivoting response, um, you know, to this pandemic. Um, everyone is trying to look for solutions, and I, I have been very excited to see how technology has um, quickly, um, you know, emerged as one of the forefronts for how we get things done and how we reach people, just like how we're here today, virtually reaching everyone until it's safe to gather um, in person again. Um, but as far as mobility goes, you know, we see a lot of, um, you know, acceleration in the adoption, particularly around e-mobility. Um, we found that um, we saw some uh, ridership with our public transit um, go down a bit during that time. And a lot of that was because people were staying at home, but um, also for safety factors. So we, we it's been very interesting. Um, we've been supporting e-bikes this past year and a half yep. and going forward um, like crazy. We've had so many rebates and just outreach um, to understand the technology and, and how do we grow this um, access to e-mobility to support um, you know, folks when they wanna have their own independence on daily transportation. So I think this pandemic has really helped um, sort of transition um, technologies rapidly. 
Uh, Drew? Hey, thanks. Um, you know, I, I think the common themes like, you know, telecommunication and all that, that that's kind of well known. But, you know, much like any other significant crisis the world faces, the pandemic put into question, like paradigms that we've established kind of for the future. Um, that being said, the inventory situation is, 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 it's a mesmerizing story, right? And everyone has seen like the stuff about, you know, chip shortages, right? Um, during this pandemic, as, as usual, you know, suppliers utilizing their, their supply chain software and rule systems, they order components that either had chips in them or required chips. And, and you know, I want to note that these chips are not like the, you know, high-end techie expensive chips. These are like the $1 power management chips that you find in like Bluetooth speakers or, or, or um, Keurig coffee makers, right? But when uh, COVID-19 hit the auto industry, like most industries, you know, that want to make a profit, um, they did like economists do, and they predicted that orders would fall through the floor, so they they canceled those orders. The chip makers utilizing uh, a, a FIFO system, they you know the first order that comes in, the first order that go, you know goes out. Um, well, once those were canceled, um, everyone got in the back of the line, right? And, and this is where we see like this auto industry kind of situation now, where you know where used car prices are spiking, and and just getting access to mobility is very difficult for a lot of people. That that being said, like, you know, OEMs have secured additional chips today, but it will take some time for it to work through. Um, but, you know, it never really affected like electric vehicles because electric vehicles generally use higher end chips. What affected electric vehicles were basically OEMs not planning for the right demand, right? And it's, it's this, this constant um, kind of uh, resistance against this, this paradigm change to electric vehicles. And I think uh, the thing coming out of the pandemic is uh, the expectation around electric mobility. It's here. And I, I think finally suppliers uh, and, and OEMs have taken it to heart. So that's the biggest change. I think coming out of the pandemic, it's going to be the smooth, smoother transition to electrification for transportation. Thank you. And, and Carter. Yeah, you know, the, the way the pandemic really affected us acutely was we had to stop offering rides as part of our testing program in San Francisco and pivot towards uh, a partnership with Marin Food Bank delivering goods um, to folks who, who couldn't access food. I think more broadly, you know, when I think about transportation, it's such a part of our everyday life. We think about we wake up in the morning, how am I going to get to work, get my kids to school and get around. And these crisis moments that we experience really allow us to throw off some of those preconceived notions about what those patterns should look like. And so it's a little, it's a little squishy, but I, but I do think that employers are reevaluating how much do people spend time in the office? How do they get there? What do we subsidize as an employer? And so I really see like we're in this moment where as we hopefully, not to jinx it, but as we begin to emerge from the pandemic, I think that there's gonna be a pretty broad reevaluation of how we get around and what the expectations are around, around mobility. And the other thing that I'd add is you know, all of the, the press that came out about this massive reduction in emissions from the, the early stages of the pandemic when nobody was commuting to work. Uh, I think that's a story that needs to be built on because we take for granted, again, we, we, we get used to the, we grow accustomed to some pretty negative externalities from our existing transportation paradigm. And I think that uh, we've had a little bit of a glimpse into what can happen when we shift that paradigm and I'm hopeful that we can build on that work to build sort of the future that all of us on this panel and hopefully folks listening in are, are excited about and thinking about. Thanks, and, and Heather, your input, please. Great, you know, not much to add here. I think everyone covered this really well, but I think I would just sort of plus one on what Carter said. We've seen employers across the country evaluate their model for for working and how we work. And a lot of big employers are moving to hybrid models or completely remote models. And that's gonna have a massive impact um, in reducing emissions in the transportation sector. And frankly, it's gonna have impacts on what new mobility is going to look like. But I think the biggest thing that we need to keep in mind is how do we maintain public solutions so that we're continuing to offer equitable solutions because we saw people, we actually saw a lot of public transit agencies have to um, close, you know, routes um, completely, which, which became a huge burden for our low income communities. And we need to make sure we're offering safe solutions for everyone to commute. Thank you. Thank you. Lots, lots of good points there. And so this next question really, I think, goes to the heart of why 
what, what we'd like attendees to come out of this conversation is all of you involved in collaborative partnerships in your respective uh, communities and the respective stakeholders you work with. And so we really want to, we want to give them some examples of, you know, how can, from your experiences and working together, uh, how can these types of partnerships, new collaborations, either accelerate or help reshape the future of mobility? And then there, number two, if, if one of you can also maybe share some examples from the work you are doing. And, and with that, Heather, I'll kind of take that and have you start that one. Great. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, um, I'm focused on our urban transformation work. And what that really means is we are helping cities and counties turn their climate commitments into action. Um, and our team will bring the technical expertise to them because a lot of times cities and counties are sort of lacking the resources they need, frankly, um, to be able to turn those commitments into action. Um, and one of the things that we have supported over the last few years is sort of this movement for cities and counties to really work with their utilities. Um, and this is something that we actually have on our website. If you wanna take a look, it's the cityrenewables.org. And we have an actions tracker and an engagement tracker. And on our engagement side, we actually have sort of visualized across the US where cities and counties have been working with their utilities. Um, and that's sort of primarily focused on renewables, but I, I bring this up here today because there is an opportunity for cities and counties to be working with their utilities um, more frequently to actually develop and co-create solutions for new mobility. Um, we've seen these types of partnerships happen from Minnesota to Colorado and Indianapolis and Utah. Um, and specifically, you know, I point out one in North Carolina where I specifically supported, but um, Duke Energy really demonstrated a lot of leadership here in working with sort of a coalition of cities and counties on looking at sort of what the system is, what are the barriers and like what's working for cities and what's not. And they really sort of leaned into this co-creation space of letting the cities bring that community perspective. That's what they should be bringing to the conversation here. They're connected to the communities and they're well positioned to work with their utilities to design new mobility, uh, new mobility solutions of the future. And Carter, does that match what, what some of Cruz is seeing and some of the new new collaboration ideas you you're, you guys are exploring? Yeah, you know, I, when we're collaborating with utilities, a lot of the work that we're doing is around shifting the paradigm away from a world in which we want everybody to own their individual vehicle, that their personal vehicle that is electric, because that is inherently inequitable. A car is an expensive uh, piece of equipment to own, and most people can't afford them. And, and if you look at uh, the, the amount of time that a, a used car will remain in commerce, belching fumes, I mean, it's 20, 30 years. And so if we want to meaningfully shift uh, miles travel over to electric miles, we need other options. And so when it comes to charging, uh, we are doing a lot of work thinking through how can we work with utilities to identify places where they've got an oversupply of electricity or an area where there is it's not been a huge investment in, um, in electrical infrastructure for, for charging vehicles. And, and because Cruise owns these large fleets of vehicles, we have an enormous in, internal demand for charging infrastructure. But that doesn't mean that that infrastructure has to be exclusive to us. And so a lot of these partnerships that we have with cities and airports and convention bureaus are helping to say, let's both invest in some of this infrastructure and let's make sure that it is available to Cruise on terms that helps us you know, launch our fleet and operate this fleet. Um, but a lot of our charging is happening overnight. And so during the day, there's, there's a tremendous scope uh, for co-creation of that charging infrastructure that's available to the public. And so not only are you helping to, to subsidize the, the you know, paying for that infrastructure, but you're also able to vastly increase the utilization rates because that infrastructure now is being used around the clock, not just during work hours, not just overnight, but you know, hopefully 24 hours a day. And, and Amy and Drew, being the, you know, the utilities from two major fast growing uh, communities here, it, are you seeing these conversations come to you more often and, and, or, or maybe there's new interesting partners coming and asking like how they can be a part of the of this solution for, for maybe EV infrastructure or mobility? Uh, and Amy, I'll start with you. Uh, I mean, I think, um, you know, collaboration absolutely is key and in, in everything we do at the utility is, is collaboratively um, deployed. 
Um, if we're talking about infrastructure where we've really seen success is when we are working um, directly with um, community stakeholders, um, as opposed to, you know, just going and deploying on our own. And it's, you know, not so much the model of build it and they will come, but let's work together and find out where, you know, what is strategically um, where the infrastructure needs to be deployed. Um, you know, collaborative collaboration um, really is um, defined by the work we're doing through um, utilizing human centered program design. And that's where we're not only working, um, you know, um, on big infrastructure pieces, but also um, more outreach with community because we're trying to have a behavior shift. We have a wonderful program called EVs for Schools where we are in the schools, we're really trying to get that conversation going, changing the, the dinner conversation um, at, you know, with, with the students and their parents. We have uh, deployed electric vehicle charging at public schools combined with EV um, curriculum. We've targeted our um, Title I um, schools where we had um, launched initially. Um, and what's happening is we're creating an educational living lab where the students are seeing their heroes, the teachers plugging in uh, their used vehicles. Typically, um, we have a lot of teachers in Austin driving EVs and their used EVs. Um, they are loving having the workplace charging. The kids are seeing their teachers plugging in and then they're getting the curriculum and they are you know, taking the information home to the parents. And we have an outreach that we do um, where we go in and work with the students. We've been able to conduct some of these um, virtually online with wonderful um, uh, virtual reality that we had support from Z Prime and Frolic to um, bring this experience to students. What, what is happening when we are working with the future leaders, with the youth of our community is we're seeing a, this um, bright light go off. They, they are engaged. They understand that climate impact is going to be the greatest challenge of their generation, and they want to be a part of the solution. So we are working with stakeholders in the community to deploy the infrastructure, but we're also grassroots working with students who are going to be really taking this to the next level with their future leadership. Thank you. So, so Drew, I want to pass this to you, but also in the context of, you know, maybe what pro programs you're doing, but Carter and now Amy have, have hit on something that, that's coming out is there's this massive shift that has to happen, right? You, you're, you're taking this, and you, you, I know you have an automotive background, so I think you have a different context, but how do we go from this, that personal ownership model, sorry about that, to, to this more fleet-centric society that we're going? So take that and, and maybe share some of the programs you guys are working on. Yeah, so, you know, I'll start macro, right? So if you look at the European model, they, they've done more of a, um, a push model where they've, they've used both the, the stick as, as well as kind of the, the you know, the, the treat, if you will, um, to basically incentivize EV adoption and uh, e-mobility, uh, whereas in the United States, it's more of a pool and it's more consumer driven. That being the case, you know, if I look at, you know, the United States, there's, there's probably two cities, maybe three, uh, you know, San Diego, maybe Colorado and Austin, where um, that one kind of, you know, I'll call it first friction point of EV adoption, which is range anxiety, which they've more or less eliminated. And, and a lot of credit has to go to, you know, to Amy, to Carl Popham to, and, and to Jackie, uh, because, you know, they met the customer kind of where they were, right? And that's, that, that's a key component. And so when we look at this, a uh, new uh, kind of shift in mobility happening where we're moving to uh, electrification. There's, there's going to be some form of, of electrification of transportation for every, every segment, right? Whether you're, you're going to be a person that utilizes almost 100% public transportation or you use none. Texas is a big personal transportation place. There's not a lot that's going to change that. We live far away from each other. It's by the nature of, of, of kind of the, you know, the, the opening of the West, right? It's, Things aren't, aren't centrally located. For better or for worse, we're going to be in this situation for a while. So, so what does that mean from a utility perspective or, or from someone who's looking at, you know, how to reduce carbon emissions or, or even in the equity conversation? It means you have to meet the customer where they are, which means, um, you know, at some point, in, you know, incentivizing um, programs and products that, that will, will help reduce Kind of carbon emissions from vehicles like managed charging programs like like and, and we, we we have those at cps energy but we will pay you money to, to charge off peak which helps you know helps reduce um, uh, a low which reduces emissions which lowers the cost for everyone in the entire area right because you, you know whole areas are charged by peak and so if we reduce that um it, it helps everyone and then 
you know, as you go down kind of the value chain, that means electrifying buses, as Amy said, making sure that, you know, you, you do education, making sure that things like rideshare programs have access to, to, to ample EV charging in those, those low to moderate income neighborhoods so that those neighborhoods benefit from, you know, reduced tailpipe emissions as well. And all these programs are being worked by, by multiple utilities. I don't want to think it's just CPS Energy, especially, you know, Austin Energy, and they, they, they have a great program. We're working closely with them to make sure that, that we bring this value chain, you know, a, across utilities. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's all about enabling customers to take advantage of these multiple programs where they need it, meeting the customer where they are. A lot of times the product comes out before. Optimally, you want it to come out when the customer Thank you. So, so to, yeah, you're talking about this this journey, and there's multi facets to it. Uh, and, and Carter, I would like to get some input from you, uh, given also you, your background in the space, even prior to Cruise. Is, is is why 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 is it important that we take a deliberate, thoughtful approach to both electrification and how autonomous vehicles be rolled out? Because I think it definitely ties into how you actually get this shift to occur, where there's whether we're just looking for the quick wins that might not have that long-term impact that I think all of us are, are invested in. Yeah, so just so everybody on the, on the panel or, or watching knows, so my background is in shared mobility, whether it's bikes and scooters or TNCs and now cruise autonomous vehicles. So I don't know what's next flying taxis or, or something, but <laughs> you know, I, I think what you, the lessons that we've learned from the bike share world and from the TNC world is that when you just come in and flood a market with limited or zero interaction with, with, with the government, you're going to have some serious problems in terms of the ability to, co to collaborate later on with gov government, but also it's just an inherently chaotic process, right? And it's not driven by good policy, it's driven by economics, uh, which short-term economics. And so we've had, what's been striking to me being in the, the AV space is that be because the technology is, is moving more slowly in terms of deployment, than just turning on an Uber or a Lyft app in a city and saying, all right, let's well, open for business, is that we really have this amazing opportunity to have the early conversations with government, with third party stakeholders, with everyone, with community, all those, those groups who need to have a voice if we're going to roll this thing out in a way that's equitable, that's smart, and that it is additive to communities. And so, you know, I, I think that looks, it, it takes a couple of different formats. I think the most, the most interesting piece for me is the work with utilities because there is going to be this massive shift to electrification of transport. And that requires huge investments in infrastructure. It requires incredibly thoughtful planning around where that infrastructure goes and how we build for that future. So that's one piece. But then the other piece is about community, right? I think that there is understandably the, the shift from riding, remember how, how we all thought it was crazy to hop in the back of an Uber with a stranger? And that seemed like the wildest thing that you could possibly imagine. Well, now I imagine there is no driver. And that is another huge jump in terms of what folks are comfortable with. And so as the technology is proven out, as it becomes every day, hopefully at some point for you to hop in the back of a car uh, with no driver and no rear view mirror and no steering wheel, I think that we have this, this really thought, this opportunity to be really thoughtful in how we grow and how we educate community, how we, we make the safety case. And so I'm, you know, I am really heartened by the fact that what I see in my industry is a full acknowledgement of that. I think we've learned the lessons from these earlier disruptor, not, not to use a, that's in some, in certain quarters, that's a four letter word. Um, and I think the process is going to actually be less disruptive because we have this, this luxury of time um, to engage community, stakeholders, government, et cetera. Um, but I think that that is why this shift to, you know, shared bikes was significant, not, not insignificant, but not transformative. Same with TNC. It's Sort of like a taxi cab with some with a GPS iPhone app in it, right? This the, the shift to electric autonomous vehicles is going to be transformational. It's why it's going to take longer, um, but it's also why it's really important to get it right because the opportunity is too big to, to squander. Jason, you, can I add a little bit to yeah, that, Carter? Yeah, you just yeah. kind of made something go off in my mind a little bit about this because I think absolutely. I mean, it, it's going to be a huge um, transition and trans transformative. Uh, bringing um, autonomous vehicle technology. But I think all of it works together as an ecosystem. Um, what's happening in, in general is just we're all changing the ways that we're getting around. 
and I think the ultimate goal here really that that started started it all um, I know for Austin Energy is really reducing greenhouse gas emissions and in order to do that we need those AVs to also be powered um, by you know electric power um, so I think uh, you know this is a great example this panel right here um, you know we have someone we've got you know people that are focused on data that that really help us make this transition. Then we have people that are working in the grassroots elements of education. We have big corporations that are developing the technologies and we have you know, utilities um, you know, like CPS that are putting the focus on EVs and the community as well as Austin Energy. Um, and it takes, it does take sort of this village of, of technology um, organizations to come together to do, I guess, to deploy this um, new ecosystem of mobility that's all very intertwined and has the intersection with just, you know, an elevated quality of life uh, with health and wellness benefits. Thanks, Amy. Uh, Heather, I wanted to bring you in a little bit because I know one of those focuses of your work is that reducing that, that vehicle's mile of travel, but also you're also having to think about some of the new models or revenue streams that could come, that can arise as, as some of these other maybe uh, revenue streams maybe condense. So what, what are you seeing there and how does that vehicle miles travel kind of play into one of those core strategies you guys are deploying? Um, yeah, so I think that the conversation around vehicle miles traveled is an interesting one because particularly from a utility perspective, like there is, like as we all know, there's a massive opportunity for increasing revenue with electrification, whether it's transportation, building electrification, like that's exciting. Um, but then there is this other side of like the conundrum of like, if we're also gonna be solving the climate crisis, we need to be reducing BMT. Um, but I don't want, you know, utilities to necessarily look at that as like, oh, we don't wanna be helping on that side of the front because that would mean, um, you know, less revenue for us, because in the grand scheme of things, you know, we're going from here to here. Um, and if there's like a little bit less because we're reducing vehicle miles traveled by 20%, I think ultimately that is going to be okay. But the things that I think utilities could be thinking about are like, how can we be involved in um, reducing vehicle miles traveled so that we're able to sort of build that goodwill within the communities um, build stronger community partnerships because we know that people are going to be happier and more and thriving, you know, if they have options to travel without massive congestion. And I think one area that might potentially be overlooked is related to electric rail. Um, you know, we do often talk about electrifying public transit, buses, um, but there's, you know, I think for you folks in Texas, there's been an ongoing conversation around doing a rail from Dallas to Austin to San Antonio to Houston for years, maybe like decades, and it keeps getting shot down. Um, and, you know, I don't think this is taboo to talk about, but we all know that companies and different entities get involved in sort of the advocacy space. Um, and this seems like a very clear opportunity for utilities to get involved to say, you know what? we do need to be pushing for electric rail to connect our communities. And this is something that we can help with. Um, it's gonna be good for the community and it's gonna be good for your business models. Thank, thank you. Thanks for chiming in there, Heather. Um, and so to, to get there, there's a lot of change going on, uh, but, but Amy, particularly I wanted you to kind of maybe drill down a little bit on this, this equity component. All this talk, you know, technologies, EVs, obviously they're coming out probably higher, higher costs. Uh, and there's lots of talks of how you do this in the right way. Lots of groups involved. I mean, Heather, you mentioned them. I think all you guys are familiar with those voices sometimes that have uh, a stronger share of voice in this conversation. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, equity is, is critical and it's, and I'm, we're, we're excited that it's a part of the broader conversation. Um, so wanted to get your thoughts on how do, we, how, do we, how do we actually put this into practice of bringing equity to the mobility sector? Thank you, Jason. Um, you know, the title of, of this panel today is the future of mobility. Um, and the way that we're going to achieve the future of mobility is reflecting on the history. We need to go back and we need to look at how we have established our systems, how we've deployed infrastructure in our cities um, since we began. And we need to go back and look at what didn't work and, and make sure that we are um, deploying um, this infrastructure, deploying technologies 
with equity in mind. Um, we need to take the people who have, you know, been put at the back of the line, um, put them in the front of the line. Uh, when we're bringing um, this, uh, you know, the power of equity actually benefits the entire community. When we're lifting people up, um, especially the most vulnerable in our community, then we're lifting all of us up. And we really can't move forward um, with any of this unless we are bringing access um, to the basics. I mean, this conversation, we're talking about transportation, but there's a ton of people who do not have access to broadband. You know, we're trying to power a lot of our technologies with smartphones. Well, not everybody has a smartphone. So we need to talk about how, how can we move along and bring um, communities along with us. And again, it's back to creating human-centered design programs. It's working with the community. It's not doing something to a community, something that we think is a great solution. It's doing something with the community. It's doing focus group surveys. It's being um, you know, out in where communities gather in the schools and the churches. Um, it's talking to people and, and getting that feedback and also introducing people to technology, getting their hands on the technology you know, if we want to have like advanced infrastructure and systems to bring drone technology for public health and safety, that's very um, concerning for some of our communities. You know, what is drone technology? Um, you know, what, what does that mean exactly? So we want to make sure that people are understanding the what and the why and how, the benefits, the, um, you know, potential unintended consequences. Um, we have done a ton of e-bike demos with some with our low-income customers, hundreds, as a matter of fact. And um, we're launching today a Metro Bike program. Metro Bike is our e-bike share, where we are um, working um, with our affordable housing communities to deploy electric bike share combined with outreach for education. We have a video campaign, but we're actually like talking to people. The people that are the actors in the video are actually residents of. Um, the HACA, the Housing Authority of the City of Austin. And I bring this up just because it really is about involving people. Um, we, we can so easily um, get lost in the technology. People can get lost in the, in the technology. Um, so how, how do we not do that? How do we accelerate technologies? Well, we need to remember that we're doing this for humans and as we are working um, as public servants, um, we wanna make sure that we are helping the most vulnerable. Um, we are helping to break the cycle of poverty by bringing affordability access to projects and programs. Um, and, it, and it really is um, absolutely foundational to everything that we're doing. Thanks, Amy, really well put. Uh, we have just over 10 minutes left. So I wanna encourage the audience to, to uh, get, send in questions for the past, but also to my great, great panelists, while we have you out together, if we're missed, feel free to, to add a point uh, that you think is important because we've, we've covered a lot here. Um, but I want to turn something to Drew here because Amy, Amy touched on some, some key points that, that have come up here is, and something I, I've actually learned in working, working with you guys, Drew, on the SA Drive Electric. Uh, and that's obviously folks know Tesla and, and they've got a They've got a, a market that follows them and, and they're bringing out lower cost vehicles. But at the end of the day, like dealers got to be heavily involved and customers and communities to get this. So are we doing enough and, and what can we do to, to better educate those, those stakeholders? Drew would, would well, love some. Well, thank you. Thank you for asking that question. And, and the answer to the question is no, we're not doing enough. And that's not because of our lack of effort, just because there cannot be enough done. Um, anytime you have this level of change, there's gonna be resistance to it. And, and resistance comes from the consumer level, from the commercial level, it comes at every single level. And so you have to get the experts involved to help, uh, you know, one, uh, kind of combat disinformation. We've all seen uh, lots of disinformation over the past years, right? And the other part is to, to inform of kind of the um, uh, objective positive measures that I could bring. So a um, little plug here on October 2nd, we're having an SA Drive event at the Pearl Studios in San Antonio. I want to definitely plug that where we're going to invite uh, consumers to come and, and walk around EVs in a, in a non-pressure environment as well as get a test drive. You get a test drive, you get a t-shirt, right? No pressure from, from, um, from dealers uh, to buy. It's, it's a test drive. You get to, to kind of you know, crank the wheels a little bit and, and see what electric vehicles are all about. Now, getting back to your question, 
if we don't educate the public, if the experts don't educate the public, then misinformation kind of gains hold. And we don't want that. We want to continue to um, expedite the trans transformation to sustainable um, uh, transportation. It it's critical that we do it. Um, you know, I, I came from a, a low income neighborhood in Houston, Texas, and I can tell you those vehicles that are on the road for 15 to 20 years, the emissions don't get better coming out of those tailpipes, right? And so if we want to do anything for the immediate co community, and I, I want to emphasize this because, you know, yes, pollution is bad, but transportation pollution is, con is, is particularly insidious because it happens at the local level, right? And you see asthma rates uh, in low to moderate income uh, in community communities, uh, they're impacted by this. And so we want to we, we, we accelerate this transformation and, and saying the positives is, is not enough. You, sometimes you have to demonstrate it. So I invite everyone to go take a test drive in an EV. And if you're in San Antonio on October 2nd, come down to, this, to Pearl Stable and take a test drive. Thank you. Uh, Heather or Carter, any, any input to add there in terms of like how you get the communities involved and, and engage them in some creative ways? Yeah, I, I think, you know, my, my sort of hobby horse right now is the, the construction of highways and sprawl in America is inherently inequitable and has a, a racist genesis, right? And so I think that we need to be honest about that. I think that we need to engage community to demand that we stop building freeways that are visible from, from space. I mean, I live in Houston and the I-10, I-45 are so enormous that they're going to drive increased congestion, increased VMT from now until forever. And I think that as long as that is our infrastructural reality, we are doomed to commit the sins of the past, right? And so I think that it is incumbent upon all of us in the policy space, as well as in the government, um, to make sure that we are crafting policies that drive density, that drive accessibility. Uh, because right now, if you have to live an hour outside of Houston, outside of Austin, outside of San Francisco, and spend all of your income on driving and on housing, uh, it, it really doesn't matter if we drive down the cost of transportation a little bit or if we, we work around the margins. The built environment is driving that inequality. And until we change that built environment, uh, we're, we're just going to be, like I said, tinkering around the edges of it. So I think we need to stop investing in highways. As Heather mentioned earlier, if I could ride rail into Austin, electric rail, I would do that once a week, right? I mean, that's, that's, it's, it's a big ticket item, but I think that it is a, a pretty obvious solution to, to all the, the emissions in between those, those cities. Um, but to me, it's making sure that the transportation advocates and policy thought leaders are engaged in issues, policy issues outside of their bailiwick, including housing, um, to make sure that they're part of a cohesive set of policy decisions and not just sort of picking something off uh, in a vacuum. Um, you just hit on a lot of really good points there, Carter. I think to just the first question that you were asking, Jason, is how to engage communities. I just will say one quick thing is that we need to realize that like we as cities, utilities, companies, energy research think tanks are not the experts in the communities. And it is not our role to understand or identify what the community needs are. It is our role to work with frontline organizations and partner with them and let them as the trusted voice in the community work with communities to help identify how to shape solutions. And that doesn't mean us asking for their free input. It means us compensating these frontline organizations because so often organizations go to them and say, can you tell us what to do without wanting to compensate them for their time? Um, and so that's actually something that RMI is doing. We're essentially putting part of our budget for every project we're doing to help engage frontline organizations and actually pay them for their time. Um, but on the housing front, I just want to say that um, one thing RMI recently put together um, an induced demand calculator um, because we have sort of identified that um, reducing VMT is a major, both that and housing is a sort of major blind spot in climate action right now. Um, and so this calculator we sort of shaped for Colorado, where we actually have a lot of progressive leaders here and, and we've set climate goals related to reducing VMT, but we still have plans to expand highways. 
And our calculator has shown that by doing that on these proposed projects will increase VMT by two to 3%, which is not gonna make it easier to achieve these goals. So we have to stop um, expanding highways and start investing in alternative modes of transportation and density. As Carter said, we are, you know, we know that people value access to transportation, to jobs, to food, um, to healthcare. We see that reflected in housing prices. Um, and we also see low-income families getting pushed out of cities where they no longer can afford to live. So we need to be intentional about creating that density that's inclusive of low-income housing and access to public transportation um, so that we can essentially meet all of these goals we're trying to meet by you know, reducing emissions, reducing the VMT, increasing access to new mobility services. So that's not going to happen in a separated, disconnected community. Uh, Drew or Amy, any any context or, or feedback there to add uh, on the, especially on that housing connection? Yeah, I mean, I can't even you know say and, and put enough emphasis on the intersection of housing and transportation and how they're so inter interconnected. Um, transportation um, in Austin and actually across the country is the number two household expense. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think you guys really covered it well. And, um, you know, we that's why we're working with our housing authority of the city of Austin. We're worth working with foundation communities and um, not only with electric bike and, and micro mobility, but we're also helping them um, realize electric vehicle charging in these communities. Um, and we're doing that by providing rebates and, um, you know, just assistance and how, how to get it done. Um, so I, you know, I know we're limited on time, but um, absolutely, you know, housing, it's where people live and they, they need access. We all need access to the transportation, um, creating first and last mile solutions, um, you know, moving things that we can right now, the bus system um, in Austin is, is going 100% electric. 2019, our CAP Metro announced that Austin Energy is supporting by um, providing the, the charging depot. Uh, we've already got over 20 electric buses on the street um, involving the community with the kiddos who are creating the artwork that are wrapping these electric buses. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's just a, it's just a huge effort and it, and it really, it's, you know, I think one of the things that you focused on early on in this talk is, is the collaboration. It's all of us working uh, together. And uh, that's really, I think, kind of the big takeaway here. Drew. Yeah, I'll be really, really quick. I, I want to, you know, say uh, I, I agree with, uh, with with the panelists on, on so many different things. The, the one thing I want to warn everyone is that we do live in a, in a consumer driven um, kind of paradigm. And, and that consumer driven paradigm is about to be impacted by, uh, you know, some legislation that may have some 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 intentional impacts, but also some unintentional impacts. Right. And so we're about to see uh, potentially a point of sale credit or, or rebate on vehicles up $12,500, right? And so when you look at, and I'm just going to you know, pull a, a Chevy Bolt or a Nissan Leaf for $30,000, and all of a sudden now is, is at $17,500, brand new off the lot, right? With all of the features and, 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 and niceties of a, of a vehicle twice to three times as much, you're going to see a massive level of adoption. And so we all need to prepare for it. Um, you know, it's one of those things we, we have to have a strategy for the future but I want everyone to understand that there is a wave coming, a precipice, right? And, and if we're not prepared for it, it, it could run over, over us. I, I, I see, you look at Austin Energy and, and they're in great shape and prepared for it. And I think CPS Energy is in pretty good shape for it. Um, but but as, as a collective, we need to think through kind of the unintended consequences as well as the intended consequences and make sure that we're able to kind of manage this incoming wave. All right. Yeah, Drew, great note. That's that's a whole conference again on itself on that, that transportation. But we got about a minute, but I want to end on, on something, something fun. Like I, I want to hear what, what new e, e, EX you guys are looking for. It could be a bike. It could be a... Drew, I probably know what yours is, but I'll go with mine. I saw Harley just came out like the beach cruiser design e-bike. I, 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 want, I, want, I want that. I want to check it out, but would love to hear what maybe what you guys, and we'll finish it off with that. Carter, what, what new e <laughs> Are you looking well, forward I have, to? I already have an electric car, but I, but I, I'm dying to get a uh, an electric uh, what do you call it, a bike with a like a front loading cargo bike. 
So I have yeah. two little boys and they love, they love riding in the, the one that I have now, but they're getting far too heavy. So if I'm going to continue doing this, I'm either going to get stronger, I'm going to get an electric bike, and I, I know which one is more likely. <laughs> All right, Heather. Uh, I kind of like hate answering this question because I would like us to all say we're getting rid of cars. We're going to just <laughs> do mobility and bike around. Um, but if I was to get an EV, I, I'm in Colorado. I think there's a lot of exciting models that are going to be good for camping and those kinds of things. So um, won't listen to anything specific, but excited to check a couple of them out. Yeah, I just became an EV driver um, yeah. as of about three weeks. I'm so excited. And, and this past weekend, I took my first EV road trip. And I will say, range anxiety is real. I got um, halfway to my destination. I found a supercharger, got charged up, and I made it to my final destination with 15 miles to spare. Um, but guess what? When I got to my second destination, there were tons of superchargers. And, and actually, I just plugged the uh, vehicle into the wall unit, uh, into the wall outlet in, in, in the garage. So while I was on the beach, the car was charging and I was good to go uh, get back home on Sunday. Um, so yeah, I, I will add that. And also our new um, uh, building uh, for Austin Energy, we're gonna be in my neighborhood, which is um, in Central East Austin. And so um, I'll be walking to work every day and I'm pretty excited about that once we're back in the office. Awesome, Drew, I know you're a Tesla driver, but what are you looking forward to? So the Ford F-150 Lightning, and everyone else on the panel might hate me for this, but, but follow my logic on this thing is amazing. I don't know if you've seen it in person, right? Shout out to Ford for creating an amazing vehicle. This is this is San Antonio, so we're a little bit more blue, blue, blue collar down here, right? I, if I want to see really the transition to sustainable transformation, this is the vehicle that's going to do it. It's going to change everything from, from you know, your, your average company with, with F-150 pickups to just the pickup guy. I, look, I don't understand the pickup guy. I'm not going to lie to you. But I want to. I want to. I want to understand why people need these pickups, and I want one. I want one badly, and so I'm excited. Right. That's the vehicle I'm excited about. Excellent. Thank you all for joining. Thanks. Thanks, all attendees. We went a little over, but I think it was worth hearing those those last tidbits. Thank you all, and stay tuned. Your next session for ETS 21 will be starting shortly.